Hi, I'm Jeff Jackson with the Heritage Foundation, where I'm the research fellow for nuclear energy policy. And I'm uh, Tom Cochran. I'm a senior scientist at the Natural Resources Defense Council and former director of the nuclear program. Great. So, so Tom, I guess we're here today to talk about nuclear energy and uh, what are some of the advantages of nuclear power and some of the disadvantages of it, how it might fit into carbon di uh, carbon dioxide constrained world and so what are the, the what are some of the things that we need to look for moving forward with nuclear energy? Yeah, what are the pros and cons? Yeah. In my view, uh, nuclear has uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, on the positive side, it's a low-carbon emitter. It's a reliable supplier of electricity. If you own the plant uh, already, it uh, provides low-cost energy, has a reliable fuel supply. On the negative side, uh, it uh, adds to the risk of nuclear weapons proliferation. In fact, it's the only energy technology that requires uh, an international safeguards regime to prevent uh, a country or non-state from uh, developing nuclear weapons out of the fuel or materials of facilities. Uh, it has a catastrophic uh, safety risk. It's the only energy supply technology that requires the federal government to ensure against such risks. Uh, uh, otherwise, we wouldn't build nuclear plants. And it has an unresolved uh, nuclear waste disposal problem, again, because the uh, waste is uh, contains plutonium, uh, which, if removed, could be used for nuclear weapons, and the waste is hazardous for thousands of years. It's the only technology that requires the federal government to take care of the high-level waste or spent fuel from the reactors. So, so I guess when we when we look at nuclear energy, you know, there are these positive attributes to it: no carbon dioxide emissions. You know, people are certainly concerned about that, and there's the whole energy security aspect of it, you know, is there enough uh, fuel out there to, to really fuel a nuclear renaissance? But there are these things that you mentioned, and, you know, I have some different perspectives on those things. Those are things that I, I would acknowledge are potential problems, but none of them are really showstoppers for nuclear energy, and that each have their own, you know, sort of ways that we can, we can manage those things. And if we look at safety first, you know, I think... The, the, the record of nuclear energy really speaks for itself. We've had, we have 104 nuclear power reactors in this country, and though we did have Three Mile Island, um, really beyond that, the, the safety record's quite good. And even with Three Mile Island, that was an instance where no one was injured or uh, no one had died as a result of that. And I think given the lessons we've learned over the years, that those lessons apply to new power reactors really bodes well for the, the, the future of safety. Uh, in the United States. Now, I think... In the, in the United States, yeah. but um, in, in my view, the U.S. reactors, the safety has improved over the last two decades. Uh, the, in, in my view, the primary factor that affects the safety of a reactor is the safety culture at the power plant, and that has improved on average in the United States. There's always concerned about outliers like... Uh, the Davy Bessie incident uh, several years ago where they discovered a football-sized hole that had decayed in the uh, – uh, eroded in the reactor head before it was discovered. Now, but what, what do those on an international basis, uh, there are many countries that are going to be part of this expanding nuclear power effort uh, where there's not good safety culture or there's no record. And uh, – so I think the probability of another serious accident uh, is is higher overseas than it is in the U.S. But do you think that that probability of an accident, let's just say for the sake of argument that it is higher overseas, should that have an impact on what we do in this country on nuclear power? Should that really stop us from moving forward and gaining some of those advantages? I would say that it shouldn't stop us here, and instead what it should move us toward doing it, sh it shouldn't stop us, but you, you said earlier there are no showstoppers or something to that effect. In my view, nuclear is, uh, power is here. It's going to continue to expand globally, but it shouldn't be 
our first choice or our second choice or third choice even. There are other electricity technologies, and I would include their uh, improvements in energy efficiency, that can provide the same um, benefits uh, in terms of electrical energy uh, that uh, are cheaper and safer uh, and uh, still don't release uh, uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. And those, I think, should be, we should do everything we can to uh, promote those first. And then if uh, there's a residual need for a new nuclear plant somewhere, uh, so be it. Uh, we may have to take those risks. But it's just not our first priority, and uh, one shouldn't kid ourselves that uh, this is a panacea in terms of uh, solving the climate change problem. But internationally speaking, though, would you sort of dis discriminate between countries where, you know, the France's and the Japan's and the UK's and even the Russia's uh, of the world might have uh, a better safety approach to nuclear power as opposed to some of these smaller countries that we see climbing on board all of a sudden, the Egypt's and the UAE's and some of the Middle Eastern countries and South American countries? And how do we as a nation move forward and help manage that? I would like to see the United States really take the lead in developing a new sort of regime for helping manage this growth in nuclear power. And I, I, I would agree with you to some extent that nuclear power certainly shouldn't be the first choice for a lot of these countries. But by the same token, I don't know that the U.S. is in a position or any country is in a position to dictate how these other nations produce energy. And given the fact that there's the, this anti-carbon dioxide pressure being put on all of us around the world, or at least should be put on all of us around the world equally, that that will give rise to an incentive for some of these countries to produce uh, nuclear power. And I would like to see the United States, instead of sort of pulling back and isolating itself from some of these, uh, some of this growth and allowing other nations like France and Russia dictate the, the rules of nu nuclear power growth around the world, that the United States take more of a leadership role and really engage these countries and help them, if they're, if they're going to build nuclear power, make sure they do it as safely as possible. Because I think one of the unique things about the nuclear in energy industry is fairly or not fairly, a, a success in one corner uh, really has an effect on the industry as a whole, as does a failure in one uh, part of the industry, whether it's in uh, a different part of the world or not, really can have an, an impact on the industry as a whole. Well, I, I would agree with you that the U.S. should exert leadership in this area. Un unfortunately, the type of leadership that this administration is exerting is uh, counterproductive to our nonproliferation interests. This administration is trying to engage other countries to promote closure of the nuclear fuel cycle, which means that uh, they're promoting the idea that, that's practiced now in Russia, France, and Japan of reprocessing the used fuel, used or spent fuel that comes out of these reactors to recover plutonium and to recycle that plutonium back into other reactors. Now, that's, uh, in the first place, that whole closed fuel cycle approach is more costly than the type of fuel cycle we practice in the United States which is the once-through fuel cycle where we take the, the used or spent nuclear fuel from the reactor and store it for a while on an interim basis, and then ultimately we, we, uh, the goal is to dispose of it in a geologic repository. When you reprocess it abroad, or even in the United States, it, it's going to have a more costly fuel cycle. It's less safe leads to greater environmental releases from the fuel cycle facilities. It leads to more nuclear waste when you, when you include the low-level and intermediate-level waste. And it doesn't do anything significant for you in terms of reducing your repository requirements. And the fuel cycle facilities needed to close those, uh, to close the fuel cycle, namely 
a chemical reprocessing plant where the fuel is dissolved and a plutonium fuel fabrication plant where new plutonium fuel is fabricated. Those types of facilities, as well as uranium enrichment plants, uh, are, are not you cannot adequately safeguard them to prevent a non-weapon state from uh, using those facilities or the materials in those facilities to make nuclear weapons. Yeah, no, we, see, of course, see that being played out today with respect to enrichment plants and an enrichment plant in Iran or a reprocessing plant in North Korea. But, yeah, well, uh, let me pick up on, on a couple of those issues. First, I mean... I, you know, given the current environment, I, I would tend to agree with you about the economics of reprocessing. But my real problem with the current system that we have in the United States for reprocessing is that it's not an option. And I would like to see the whole spent fuel management uh, process be taken over by the private sector and allow them to really dictate whether or not reprocessing uh, fits into their economics and what type of reprocessing might work or not work and really allow the full cost of nuclear energy to be folded into those costs. You know, I think... Well, I, well in, in the United States, you know, it's been an option commercially since the Reagan administration, but utilities here and energy well, companies it, no, it, here, It's not been an option because the federal government has taken control of waste management activities because of the 1982 Nuclear Waste Policy Act. So while technically someone could build a reprocessing facility, I suppose, and operate it and you know the Department of Energy every once in a while most recently in this last the last couple of budgets has moved toward that it's not a real option certainly not a market based option and not one that's being driven by industry itself or that fits into industry itself and what i would like to see is for that whole spent fuel management regime be taken back out of the the, the public sector and put back into the private sector so that uh, the, the utilities themselves can decide what are the best ways to manage spent nuclear fuel. And if uh, recycling and interim storage and these things other than direct deposit into Yucca Mountain makes sense for them, then I would think that a recycling or a nuclear fuel services industry would emerge here. Um, and that, that's what I would like to see happen. So not to, to me, the way it's currently set up, the way the, 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 the spent fuel management system is set up is too... It's not flexible enough to be conducive to a nuclear renaissance in this country. Well, I, you know, for, I, I would agree in some respects. Uh, first, we are over 50 years into the nuclear power age, and there's no operating commercial or uh, geologic repository for uh, commercial spent fuel or high-level waste or even defense waste anywhere in the world. And, and l let me just, let me just interject quickly there. I think that's one of the reasons, that's one of the in incentives for the private sector to develop some alternative waste management regimes. And so long as the government's in charge of that, the utilities have no reason to want to do anything with it. Well, I, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to let the the energy companies and the utilities manage their own waste like they do for other technologies, uh, manage it in the, in the nuclear sector. I, uh, you need uh, some stringent safeguards or regulations uh, that would still be the responsibility of the federal government. I don't have a serious problem with the industry itself finding uh, and citing a repository. The, uh, this brings us to the issue of uh, how, we're, how the government has mismanaged this in the United States at the Yucca Mountain site. In my view, we had a very good program uh, uh, laid out by the Congress in the, in the 80s for uh, moving ahead with a geologic repository. We, we appointed one agency, the Department of Energy, to go out and find the best site, sites in the country and narrow the uh, sites down to a few and then one or two. And then we had a separate agency, the EPA, to set the criteria for whether the site would be adequate. And a third agency, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to make the determination whether the site met the regulatory standards. 
But the federal government, <clears throat> and, and there I mean both the Department of Energy, EPA, and to some extent the NRC, have botched both the siting process and the uh, development of the criteria, and we're left with this Yucca Mountain site that, uh, uh, in part because of the way the siting was botched, uh, has no political support. Uh, well, you know, I, I won't disagree with you about the OE's botching of spent fuel management and even of Yucca Mountain. I wouldn't necessarily say that Yucca Mountain is the wrong place to do it, though. And there was political support at one time for Yucca. I think that the, the real problem there is that, again, not to beat a dead horse, but it's the structure of the system whereby up until a few years ago, the nu no one really thought there was going to be a nuclear renaissance. Um, we, the nuclear en energy industry, while chugging along and becoming more efficient, really wasn't looking at a future of, uh, of growth. And I think that people generally saw Yucca Mountain as something that would open eventually. Um, it became a political issue that people could use to, 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 to gain political points. And there was really not a whole lot of movement to open it one way or the other. The nuclear power, the nuclear plants could continue to operate and either, you know, till their, until their cooling pools, which is where you would place the spent nuclear fuel directly after leaving the reactor. They would put it in the cooling pools until they become filled. And we've already seen some nuclear power plants begin to put them in, put the spent fuel in dry storage. And I think that system sort of was working because eventually everyone knew that Yucca Mountain would be large enough to basically hold most of the spent nuclear fuel that we were going to produce. Um, what changed the debate, though, in the last couple of years is this movement toward more nuclear energy to meet, to meet the carbon dioxide mandates. I think that's causing everyone to really rethink spent nuclear fuel management. And, that, and we're currently in a transition period where, every, where the, the, the context of the Yucca Mountain debate is going from one where there was not a whole lot of urgency to resolve that to one where we're seeing a whole lot more urgency to resolve that. So I think that, that Yucca Mountain can be resolved. I think that that's, that that's going to be a critical part of spent fuel management under whatever regime that we have. I think one of the ways to, to, to move beyond the current stalemate is to start talking about Nevada, not just as being the nuclear waste dump of the country, but really to talk about what are some of the other facilities that could be placed there in Nevada, make it really the Simi Valley of the nuclear renaissance. You know, we, we're going to need enrichment. We're going to need fuel, uh, different fuel services. We were talking about uh, perhaps other fuel back end or, or uh, spent fuel management services. These are all things that maybe if we talked about putting them into Nevada to go along with that Yucca Mountain site, that maybe Nevadans, as you start talking about the jobs and, and, and things of that nature, that they may be more inclined to accept Yucca Mountain, and you might be able to build more political support that way. Well, I thought you were a free market guy. I didn't know you were going to cram these things down the throat. No, no, I, I'm uh, absolutely a free market guy, <laughs> and, and what I would suggest is that industry themselves would be the ones to go to Nevada and say, look, we, we're, we, we're going to be building nuclear energy, and there's a lot of services that we need, and, geez, we'd love to come put this stuff here. The, the, market, mechan or the market factor in this analysis would be, these guys need Yucca Mountain to be open. I mean, that becomes the incentive for them to put stuff in, in Nevada, that if they can convince the Nevadans that if they allow Yucca to be opened, that they also get all these other benefits. And if they can show that Yucca can be operated safely, then it seems like a win-win situation. So now I'm all for the market um, uh, deciding these things. Well, good. That, that brings us to the... Uh, another well, issue. You, before we uh, move on to another issue, I'd like to just get back to, to something you said about the international aspects of this. And I just want to sure. make a quick point. That, look, I agree with you 100% that, that there are two things that we need to keep our eye on as we see the growth of nuclear power emerge around the world. And that's enrichment, uh, uranium enrichment, because the natural uranium that we mine out of the ground is not generally used for n nuclear power production. Um, so you need to enrich that uranium, and then the reprocessing part, because those are the two things that we need to keep a control. We need to keep control of, and in so long, I think that we can control those things that we have. Either the the current uh, countries have nuclear weapons, the weapon states doing that, or I wouldn't even mind seeing that expanded, so that you know every country can be assured that they have fuel serv access to fuel services. But as long as it's well, of controlled, course, of course, I, I, I don't see a whole lot of problem with the growth of nuclear energy. I'm sure you would agree that you shouldn't put 
uranium enrichment plants in non-weapon states such as Iran? I certainly would agree that we don't put uranium enrichment plants in Iran and, and right. many now, other countries that are... But then you run into this problem. Uh, if you want to keep them out of countries like Iran and any number of others we could agree on, uh, you have to have a non-discriminatory regime or, or one that doesn't further discriminate beyond the sort of discrimination that's in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty between weapon states, states that have nuclear weapons and states that don't. Agreed. But the countries that are giving us the most trouble about restricting the spread of the uranium enrichment technology are some of our allies like Canada, Brazil, Argentina, yeah. uh, uh, Australia. While these are states that we would say today are, are don't represent a uh, nuclear proliferation threat, the fact that they are promoting building enrichment plants in their countries, all non-weapon states, other non-weapon states will use uh, that as a basis for justifying building similar enrichment capacity in their own countries. And, yeah. and so then you have it in uh, places like Iran today, maybe next year or, or, or in a decade, uh, uh, pick a country, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, I, look, and that's where... Tom, the, I, I agree uh, with everything you just said, and I think that what you just described is what happens if we continue down this road of the nuclear renaissance without having a new 21st century governing regime that sort of sets the rules of the road and that allows those countries and incents them to not go down the road of enrichment by assuring them that they will have access to the fuel services that they need to support their nuclear industry. So, look, I, I agree with you. Everything that we, you just described okay. is, a, is a problem, assuming that we continue to rely on the status quo or the existing regimes to manage this global growth of nuclear power. That's why what I would like to see happen. And I don't have all, all right, the answers right now, but we need to put on the table and start debating what is this new governing regime going to look like and how do we manage this growth? Exactly. Now, let's m move to uh, another free market issue. The, we, we've gone through these problems of uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons, nuclear uh, uh, catastrophic accidents, nuclear waste disposal. All of these problems, uh, for one reason or another, have been turned over to the federal government to solve or some international institution to solve. They've, they've, they haven't effectively solved these problems. Uh, now, the only remaining issue for the utility or energy generating company in the United States, having passed off all its problems to the federal <laughs> government, is that the nucle new nuclear plants are uneconomical. So they've approached this problem just like the others. They've run up to the hill, paid their lobbyists to go get all sorts of subsidies so that the federal government will pay the difference between the costly nuclear plant and the least cost alternative. But let's be honest about this, though, and I'm not justifying that. But, I hope I am. Being but honest. Yeah, you, you are. But let's, that's not unique to the nuclear energy industry. That no, that doesn't make it good, That though. is an energy industry problem, and it's a farm industry problem, and it's a problem that exists when you have a $3 trillion federal budget and you have a earmark it, system it, like we did. Exactly. So but, th these but, are broad but, problems, and that, that doesn't excuse it. I'm not excusing it. All right, but let's make, a, let's make uh, some distinctions here. There is a legitimate basis for government subsidies for some um, uh, uh, programs. One would be the government should be investing in research and development for technologies that have such a long lead time that you don't have a economic incentive I, based, for the private industry to get in and develop those I, technologies. I agree. For, for, for basic, right, basic R&D types of issues, nuclear and otherwise. 
And then, right. And then you have uh, a legitimate basis for the government to subsidize technologies to bring to, to lower the cost to bring them into the marketplace to where they can be self-sustaining. And we did that initially in the nuclear business in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And we've done that with... We're doing that today with solar and wind. But we've been doing that for a long and time other with solar and wind and other renewables. Well, but the but the the solar costs are continuing to come down. But we're subsidizing this mature nuclear industry after we have put in over a hundred billion dollars worth of subsidies, and and these subsidies we're giving out now are not going to reduce the costs of these plants. Well, let, let, I mean, we're subsidizing, for example, the ge- we'll be subsidizing the General Electric Company, the second biggest corporation in the world, to do what they would do otherwise, which is get a license for generic design, and they want to come to the NRC and get that license so they can market it in China and overseas. They, we shouldn't have to use federal dollars to subsidize the yeah, I, GE I, I, I probably agree with you on a lot of what you just said, but let, let's look at the nuclear energy industry specifically for just a moment. Um, sure. Now, I, I would argue that the greatest risk to the nuclear en- energy industry in the United States right now is government itself. That, you, as you described, the government subsidized the industry in the 50s and 60s very directly, and it did that for a number of reasons. I would argue it did it because... The, the Navy and the, the, the military establishment understood that a robust commercial nuclear industry would really help sustain the, mili- the needs of the, the military, and that had a lot to do with it. So you, you, you had this energy, this industry that was developed with very high support of the federal government. And although that direct subsidy evolved into a less direct subsidy, the nuclear industry was never weaned away from the government. And whenever, the gov- whenever for whatever reason, um, the government soured on the nuclear industry, public soured on the nuclear industry, rightly or wrongly, the industry was not able to survive because it, it, always, it always had that government crutch. It had two government crutches. Now, that's the reality. Today, I would argue that that same mentality still pervades the nuclear industry too much, that they still feel they need the, the, the government subsidy in order to succeed. I would agree with them to some extent insofar that the federal government is the greatest risk to the nuclear industry. So I don't mind seeing some initial subsidy as defined in the nuclear poli- the, the Energy Policy Act of 2005. As long as it's limited, it has to be limited. It shouldn't, you know, right now it should subsidize five to seven reactors, something like that. Nothing more than that. And at that point, it needs to be cut off entirely. Um, no big loan guarantees that are indefinite and all that kind of stuff that we hear some advocates of nuclear power talk about. I just would like to see some of the costs or some of the risks risk mitigated that government itself poses on the industry until we get some of these reactors built. Then cut it off. And if nuclear can't well, compete, uh, then you, you won't hear uh, me right. advocating we, for it. Let's agree, then, that we ought to cut off further subsidies for new nuclear plants. And let's, But I, I would part way, ways with you as regarding whether the we should be subsidizing these first mm-hmm. six or however many they, they're going to build with the subsidies in the 2005 uh, Energy Act. I don't think those subsidies are re- reducing the costs of new nuclear plants. Yeah, I, in fact, the costs since 2003 have uh, the estimated costs of a new nuclear plant has, has more than done. Yeah, I mean, I probably don't disagree with you on that. And, I, I look at it and, more as a risk mitigation technique. And you're su- and and he, here we are in the 2005 Energy Act subsidizing uh, on, on the vendor side, uh, Areva which is owned by, 96% owned by the French government, so we're using taxpayer money to subsidize the French government. We're subsidizing not only GE, as I mentioned earlier, but Hitachi, which is in partnership with GE, or Toshiba, which bought Westinghouse, and Toshiba is now 10% owned by the uh, Kazakh, uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, why should we be hitting up uh, working stiffs in Colorado who can't pay their home mortgages to subsidize the French government and the Kazakh government and some of the biggest industries 
uh, uh, many of them uh, uh, Japanese. And then, and then some of these subsidies are going to big energy companies in the United States, like Exelon and Entergy and but, Dominion but, and Duke oh, and Southern. I agree with all of that, but the same is true for the renewable subsidies also. Most of the big renew, most of the, the companies who dominate the renewable industry are also these same big companies because they're all energy producers. Well, you know, but these, as I mentioned these earlier, these arguments a, hold true across the energy spectrum. I think the goal. Well, they should, do. They don't. I, they don't because the difference is who makes those curly Q light bulbs that are filled with mercury. The difference is the nuclear business has gotten its share of subsidies. It's entered the market. It's been around for fifty years. There are vendors out there. There, there are thirty plants under construction worldwide. They will sell you a plant over here anytime you're willing to pay for them. You don't, we're simply subsidizing those plants in order to pay for an uneconomical plant. We're subsidizing solar in order to bring the manufacturing costs down, and the manufacturing costs have been steadily coming down as the federal government supports that industry, and the same applies to wind. Now, there will come a time, I think, when, when we can get out of the wind business. But if we're going to subsidize any technology, we ought to subsidize the ones that are safe and that are, are you, you can't build a nuclear weapon out of a windmill, for Christ's sake. I know, because they don't produce uh, enough energy to sustain. The <laughs> oh, yes, they do. There's more wind power entered into the global market last year than nuclear power. All so, right, well, look... I, I, I agree in concept of most of what you said. I, I think that we should get subsidies out of the energy business. Okay, we agree and, on and, that. But I, I would like to go back to why there is a legitimate role, a limited role, for these Energy Policy Act subsidies for the nuclear and energy industry in the United States. It, and it's simply not because it's going to lower the price, and although some may a little bit. But I really feel like the nuclear energy industry has a legitimate gripe with the U.S. government in terms of, the U.S. government has ultimate say over its success and, and its lack of success. And given the unstable political environment that has overlaid the nuclear industry for so long that these uh, subsidies, at least some of them, help mitigate that risk. And once a handful of those plants are built, then I think that the legitimacy of those subsidies goes away and then you won't hear me advocate for any more of them. And, and I just want to make clear that everyone understands that I'm not advocating for long-term subsidies for the industry at all in any way, shape, or form. And if, if, if it weren't for the Energy Policy Act that's already in place, I probably wouldn't be advocating for the act to bring in these additional subsidies. But Then, then, but the, then, then we agree that the, uh, the, uh, the we should oppose, we would both oppose loading up the uh, uh, Lieberman Warner bill. This is the climate bill before the Senate uh, uh, now. Uh, we would oppose loading that bill up with further largesse for the largesse for the nuclear industry. I would say for the energy industry in general, and that the mere existence of the Lieberman Warner bill is more than enough incentive for any nuclear, wind, or solar, or any non CO2 emitting power source to be successful. Um, I mean, that we would put a cap on carbon dioxide puts all these sort of, uh, not sort of, all of these non-emitting energy sources at a distinct advantage over the other emitting sources. And that, that goes for things like electric cars and, and sort of those technologies as well, I would argue. So my, my view on things like carbon dioxide, and, you know, I would probably fall into the category of global warming denier. But for the sake of this argument, let's just say that, 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 that we need to cap carbon dioxide. Uh, what I would think the role of the government should be is not to tell us how to meet those carbon dioxide mandates, but to set the mandate and then allow the market to function naturally to, to meet those objectives. Well, I think we probably agree on that. I, uh, the, the most economically efficient way to address climate mitigation is to uh, set up stringent limits on the permitted emissions of, of CO2 and other greenhouse gases and then let the market pick the winners. And that's, in effect, what you do with 
any other pollutant, such as mercury emissions from uh, coal plants, you set a limit, or sulfur dioxide emissions, you set a limit on the emissions. And then all the alternative technologies can compete uh, with that technology under these new uh, constraints. If you set such limits uh, in a climate bill on CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions, that would, in effect, be the uh, most helpful single policy to the U.S. nuclear industry because it would increase the cost of of uh, coal plants and gas plants. Now, without question, in, in fact, I think that unless you see the CO2 limits in place, I think that we're going to build a handful of, of new nuclear plants in, in the next decade or, or whatever. But we're going we're, we're to build the number of nuclear plants in the United States that the Congress has shown a willingness to heavily subsidize. Yeah, I, I, and beyond that, I don't think we're going to build in the, many until you get... Uh, uh, very stringent uh, limits on CO2 emissions. Absent some other technology shift or something like that. Well, I think, I, you know, the problem nuclear is going to have is once you put these limits on CO2 emissions, it's still got to compete with a number of other uh, technology options that b- probably by 2020 will be far more competitive, uh, uh, far, far, far cheaper than than nuclear. I mean, already I think nuclear cannot compete with with wind at the margin. It cannot compete with uh, 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 combined gas technology, uh, heat and power sources in in buildings and in indu- for industrial use. And it certainly none of these technologies compete with just improving the efficiency of in-use, uh, which is the cheapest uh, of all the alternatives. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, um, all things being equal, but in the energy business, all things are not equal, and I think that there are some regions where wind is not as conducive, where uh, nuclear may be more conducive, where, uh, you know, I, whenever we talk about carbon capture and sequestration and, and clean coal technology, where when you burn coal, you capture that carbon dioxide and do something with it. I think there's a lot of people who talk about what that might bring to the table, but I think there are a lot of problems that, that we may come to with, with regard to that um, as well. So, you know, the, the, and and that, that's what I'm advocating. I, I believe in nuclear, personally. I think that the technology is there um, to really provide a lot of advantages uh, for the country, for the world. But that's not, from a policy perspective, what I advocate. You know, I adv- advocate letting the market pick the winners and losers, let technology evolve uh, in a way that, that allows America's needs to be met. And, I, you know, if, if, if one region, if wind works well there, then so be it. If carbon capture and sequestration works well there, so be it. If nuclear works well there, so be it. Or if it's some combination thereof. What I'm saying is that we need to uh, remove the obstacles to all these things and let them, uh, let them succeed or fail on their own. Well, I, I I agree with that, but I also uh, think we ought to remove the thumb of these nuclear lobbyists from the scale so that uh, they don't. Uh, 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 so these other technologies will have a fair yeah. shake I, in, in the market. You know, I think you're giving the nuclear lobbyists too much credit. The wind lobbyists, <laughs> you know, it's big wind out there, huffing and puffing on Capitol Hill. That's you know. Making all the a lot well, of difference. You you would agree though that that the investments in wind have brought the price of uh, wind and the efficiency of wind technology has improved and the price has come down. And so, and, and, and you know, wind has all of these benefits that I mean, it has none of these problems that nuclear has. It you, you don't make nuclear weapons out of wind. Uh, you don't have catastrophic accidents. You don't have a long-term waste problem. Uh, you still get the benefits of uh, uh, mitigating climate change, 
I mean, we ought to be promoting wind everywhere and, we can where it makes economic and, sense. And the private sector should be out there, you know, in making those investments. My problem is when the government gets in there and starts doing that. Well, you uh, let's say let's say it's a wash from a, from an economic standpoint. Uh-huh. You would surely you and Heritage would advocate uh, uh, invest uh, building. Uh, no. Wind farm before you build a nuclear power. Well, we we wouldn't make that decision at all. I mean, that wouldn't be something that we would advocate one way or the other. We would say that the utility should be able to decide uh, which way to go. So no. It, well, it's not just a utility. It's a, it, you have a, a commission in a in a regular regulated uh, market such as the southeast and the community. Uh, you know, com- some communities yes, would would sure. sooner have a nuclear power plant than have the tops of their mountains. You know, cut off to put on windmills, or oh, they don't cut the tops of the mountains off to put on wind. You cut the tops of mountains off to provide coal, which is uh, uh, one of the it's probably the worst technology you can generate electricity with. Well, oh, I, I know that I have seen tops of mountains lined with windmills. I'm not judging it one way or the oh, other. I don't. I, yeah, I'm not, lined with windmills is one thing, but I, I'm not judging it one way or the other, Tom. I'm, I'm just saying right, that some okay. communities may rather have a nuclear power plant than the windmills. That, that's all I'm saying. And these are all the variables that people have to bear in mind moving forward, and that one of those technologies shouldn't be advocated over the other by the Heritage Foundation, or much less by the federal government. You know, these are all the things that that every American is best served if the communities and the utilities and the, co- the public utility commissions, they decide on their own what's best for the rate payers, what's best for the environment, what's best for the economy. These are all things that need to, to, to come together and that as government sets mandates or puts up roadblocks to this technology or that, th- those are problems. So I think what, 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 we're, what, what the conclusion ultimately is is that the United States has a specific energy profile today. I think a lot of us would like to see that energy profile transition to something else for whatever reason in the future. And what we really need to to do to make sure that it happens efficiently, cost-effectively, economically, is allow these technologies to compete. Now, the, 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 the secondary question, or I guess it's a secondary question, is what role does the government play in that? Should it subsidize certain technologies? When should it or should it not? You know, I would come down on the side of the government should stay as far away from all of these things as, as humanly possible. But I recognize that whether it's the lobbyists or whatever the reason is, you know, the government's involved in, in this. So we need to make sure that that intervention is mitigated, because I think that government intervention is generally not a good thing. So we need to mitigate that, minimize it, and hopefully that over time uh, we develop a new energy profile that allows the United States to expand economically, be clean, you know, all the things that I think, you know, really all of us want. Those of us who believe in nuclear energy certainly don't believe in it because you can take plutonium out and turn it into a nuclear weapon. We believe in it because it's a clean we think affordable energy source and that those negative attributes can be controlled and aren't that big of a threat, assuming we have the right controls in place to manage those uh, those problems. Well, I, I don't... Uh, I agree with you on minimizing the f- federal involvement in, on the subsidies front. You're obviously going to have to keep the government involved on the non-proliferation issue uh, They've uh, failed to solve that problem to date with respect to uh, the global expansion of nuclear power. Uh, let's hope they can do a little better in the future. Uh, you want to turn the waste issue over to private enterprise. I'd say, oh, okay, next time you build a nuclear plant, you're responsible for the disposal of your waste. I'm happy with that. All right, well... I, I think that uh, we, we've covered a lot of the issues. and Well, I think we just about covered them all. Right, well, hey, it was good talking to you, and I, it was fun. So we'll, My pleasure. We'll be in touch. See you all later, right, Jack. Time perfect. Yeah, great.